Hey there, welcome to Liquid Margins. This episode is number 34. Can't believe it. Um, we've had so many great shows and it's gotten to the point where I'm starting to forget um, which ones, which topics we've covered because we've had that many shows. So oh, this one is orientation by annotation hypothesis in first year seminar. Today's guest, um, Cheryl Sawin, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, Associate Director and Associate Professor, Intellectual Heritage Program at Temple University, Jacqueline Howard, Administrative Assistant Professor of Technology and Women's History at Tulane University, and Heather Walder, Assistant Teaching Professor, Archaeology and Anthropology, University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. And then our moderator today, the inimitable Jeremy Dean, VP of Education at Hypothesis. And I am going to stop talking now and turn it over to Jeremy. So again, thanks for being here. It's going to be a great show. Awesome. I'm super excited to be here with you all um, to talk about this topic of uh, social annotation and the first year experience. Um, I want to start off general. It uh, looks like there are a lot of folks in the audience who, you know, are teaching in similar programs. Um, but I just want to start off general to sort of get everybody to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what is the first year experience? Uh, what is the, what are, what are first year seminars? What is, what, why are they important? What are the goals? What are the challenges? And maybe just go around them talking about that very general idea of this particular type of course. Uh, and maybe starting with you, Cheryl. Oh my goodness. All right. So this is going to be awkward because the um, intellectual heritage program um, at Temple University isn't uh, a traditional first year experience. Uh, we frequently do have sophomores in the courses and sometimes even uh, transfer students with junior status. However, it functions very much like a first year seminar in that it is typically students introductions to the humanities and to the liberal arts. Um, students coming from all different schools and colleges within Temple University tend to be pretty siloed and they don't oftentimes have the opportunity to participate in a seminar style course where they get to communicate with each other, share ideas, build knowledge, um, and really learn how to engage deeply with ideas and uh, sometimes difficult texts. Uh, our two courses are called The Good Life and The Common Good. So students get to not only read works of ancient and modern um, literature, philosophy, political philosophy from a diverse and global group of authors, but they get to connect all of those uh, texts and ideas to things that are going around in the world today and to themselves and participate in a lot of self-reflection and self-efficacy, which I think are usually key components of a first year experience course as well. Uh, learning how to be uh, a member of a learning community, uh, learning how to challenge one another respectfully, uh, learning how to take perspectives into account uh, when thinking about your own position and where you stand, um, learning how to make claims, um, and use evidence to support those claims uh, and uh, also hopefully have fun in the process and build community that isn't just focused on um, intellectual pursuits, but maybe on social pursuits as well. So it functions in that space, uh, but because of um, agreement associations with community colleges and uh, the university's commitment for students to graduate in four years, we're a little bit more flexible when it comes to required first year courses. That was amazing, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, yeah, let, let's let's continue in that vein and sort of understand from each of you the character of, of your particular first year teaching experience. We'll use first year in quotation marks because maybe, you know, there's uh, some diversity there, which I think is great. Um, but it, there's clearly going to be a theme here with everything that Cheryl said. But let's uh, let's hear what it's all about at Tulane uh, from Jacqueline. Hi, um, thanks for having me. So at Tulane, we have a program called the Tides Program, and this is a first year 
um, experience program that pulls um, instructors from across the entire university. And it really gives us the freedom to develop courses um, based off our expertise. And the reason that they do it this way is they want, um, Tulane wants um, students to build deep relationships with faculty. And so um, students can take courses that they're interested in um, and um, meet with faculty um, and have a close experience with them. Um, another goal of this program is so that students can be introduced in a safe space to college level skills. Um, so we focus on close reading, using the library, but also using student services, um, such as counseling services and other services that are available to students. Um, so we have a peer mentor in the course that helps facilitate that. We also have a goal of connecting students to New Orleans with Tulane being a um, where it's positioned in our community as a privileged, mostly white university. Um, we try to create um, intentional ways to get students involved in the New Orleans community because often they don't leave campus. And so we have field trips and things like that to help get students into the into the community. Um, and it's also about meeting local leaders and having students have um, a better connection with New Orleans. That's amazing. Uh, and I should say uh, that we have a distinguished alumni of uh, Tulane University. That's uh, one of our, uh, my colleagues here, Becky George, who's, uh, I don't know if Tides was, uh, I think Tides was around. Uh, Becky's been very interested in connecting with Tides um, as she started to be this customer success manager for, for Tulane and, and recently made a visit there. Uh, thanks, Jacqueline. So Heather, how is the program at University of Wisconsin-La Crosse uh, similar, different in focus from, from Tides and from the Intellectual Heritage Program at, at Tulane? Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me. Our first year seminar program is actually very young. Uh, we were in the process of developing it in the 2018-19 school year, um, doing some kind of just preliminary um, trial courses with a few faculty. And I trained for the program and actually taught my first first year seminar in fall of 2020. Um, so uh, what we've been doing over the last few years is helping students adjust to college and uh, utilizing similar content across all first year seminars on campus where we focus on modules like belonging or using library or other campus resources, um, finding scholarship money and other kind of common themes. And then each instructor who teaches a first year seminar um, also includes two credits worth of their own content. So mine is myth busting in archeology, span no ancient aliens here. And professors try to choose topics that they think will be discussion sparking and that will interest students to maybe draw them into the major, but also give them a chance to discuss topics that are relevant and uh, relate to current issues. Uh, each first year seminar includes a group project and this gives students uh, practice doing collaborative work, how to set up a Google document, but also how to communicate effectively with one another. And um, the way that that project works uh, across the seminars is really variable. We have a lot of freedom in how we organize uh, each of these classes as individual instructors. And um, overall, the goal is to just, I think, like Jacqueline said, give the students a chance to connect with a faculty member in a small class setting, give them a chance to do, read deeply, to think about a topic that maybe they've never thought about before and help them get the tools that are gonna to be necessary for them to be successful on our campus. That's awesome. Uh, thanks, Heather. Uh, well, tell us how social annot annotation has been particularly useful in this, in this specific teaching context. Um, why social annotation, why hypothesis for the first year seminar or for a first year experience course? And I'm going to go in reverse order this time, Heather, if you don't mind uh, continuing to talk, and then we'll, we'll go to Jackie and, and to Jacqueline and to Cheryl. And uh, also feel free to unmute and huzzah or, um, or even disagree with somebody else. And it doesn't have to be super you know, uh, structured in terms of, I love this has become a conversation. But Great. Heather, why social annotation yeah. for... Uh, for your first year uh, experience program? Well, um, so I designed the course initially as a completely online asynchronous course uh, because that's the modality that I was teaching in in fall of 2020 and spring of 2021. 
And so I wanted to figure out a way to have students engaging really deeply with the content. And so I was familiar with Hypothesis. I had heard about it in a um, digital pedagogy workshop uh, years ago, like in grad school. And I was kind of digging through my toolbox, trying to figure out a way to have those deep conversations while using an asynchronous format. And that is, um, I ended up using it uh, that first fall semester and then was able to work with our instructional design folks to get it integrated in Canvas for the next semester and then continued using it even when we moved back to in-person classes because I really did value the level of conversation and students also indicated that they liked being able to annotate on the text, being able to think before they spoke, so to speak, um, and came to class more prepared. So um, even though the modalities are completely different and I use it in different ways, I found that the annotations were still improving the level of reading and conversation that the students have, um, no matter what way we're meeting that week. I imagine that the first year experience uh... Uh, teaching first year experience, first year summer would be particularly challenged during, during the pandemic and in a uh, uh, remote or even or asynchronous context because it is so much about uh, coming together and, and being together and working together um, and getting that sense of belonging. So that must have been a challenge. Super interesting. Let's go back the other way and hear from Jacqueline and Tulane about how social annotation was particularly interesting to you for teaching in the TIDES program. Um, so I started using social annotations when I was co-teaching a higher level course, um, and it really helped us be able to um, kind of get rid of the, the bland reading response. I feel like discussion forums and those things are starting to become kind of cookie cutter. And so we were in pandemic mode and we were looking for a tool that would be more interactive in real time. Um, and then after we did some trial and error era, and this is with my colleague, Dr. Claire Daniel, um, we created up some assignments over that and that I was able then to apply to my first year experience course. Um, and so what we do, what the, this assignment does is um, it replaces the reading response. So students do a deep reading before they come to class to discuss the reading. Um, and what it helped with the first year experience is our students were experiencing a high level of disengagement um, during the pandemic. And that's only gotten worse as the sem as semesters have um, have moved forward. Um, and so they, this was a way for us when people, when students stop talking to be able to go back to the social annotations and spark new conversation from what they've already started. So it, it was a nice foundation point that not only helped them prepare for that hard discussion, but then also helped me sustain the discussion um, later on when things were getting tough in the classroom. That's great. Uh, Cheryl? Um, wow, so very similar um, motivations for using social annotation. I, I came to Hypothesis uh, as a dinosaur through rap genius. And so, mm. um, yeah, yes. So I- I, I forgot about uh, our history there. <laughs> yeah, see, now it all comes back to you. So um, when, when um, rap genius created lit genius and Jeremy was kind of a spearheaded, spearheaded that, um, I, had students annotate the Tao Te Ching, um, it was a text that was very difficult to, uh, to, to parse, even though it might seem easy to read. And I, I see that I have some colleagues from um, our program on here today. So, and many of them are, are much better suited to talk about that text and teaching it. But um, I found that students, I know that both of you talked about belonging and the importance in the freshman seminar of feeling as though you belong. And our students at Temple frequently feel as though uh, they don't have the tools or the capacity to have original thinking about uh, texts that are, are un unusual for them or um, challenging. And, you know, you always have those students who might raise their hand and say, I, I know this is a stupid question, but, or they might, in response to a question that you or a fellow classmate asks, say, oh, this is a stretch, but, um, but. I found that when, when annotating in a social setting where students can see one another engaging with ideas, um, it, it helps students very quickly recognize that they can do hard things or that you know, their question is a question that was shared widely by everybody else in the class. Um, not only does this uh, help to increase engagement 
uh, but it allows students to have some a sense of uh, authority or um, self worth uh, when it comes to directly engaging with content. What really whether it it's um, you know a two pack song or uh, you know the uh, chapter two of the Tao Te Ching or uh, even uh, you know an article from Vice magazine. So uh, I find that the power of collective annotation uh, is you, you know magnifies engagement tenfold, uh, but also really is uh, a tool that helps with this piece about belonging. Cheryl, I wanna continue and maybe kind of start to open this up into more of a conversation in terms of that idea of, um, it sounds like, you know, making students feel like they belong, making students more comfortable, you know, coming to college, it's, 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 it's a new experience, right? New and difficult reading, new and difficult expectations. Um, and I wonder if we could just sort of riff on that idea of um, the various aspects of the first year experience that are trying to sort of prepare the student for the intellectual or academic activities that are that are coming and how social orientation helps with that. If that was too vague, but can you riff on that, Cheryl? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I was thinking about a sample assignment that I might be able to share with folks, and this is not sexy at all, but... I do have students annotate the syllabus, and especially as Heather and Jacqueline were talking about in this kind of post-ish pandemic world, and in so you know so many students uh, being shunted into online learning unwillingly. And I'm a, a an online educator. I love teaching online, especially asynchronously online pre-pandemic. I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about it anymore, but um, uh, students don't really know how to be students in, in the college setting. A lot of times high school, especially public high schools, don't provide syllabi for their students, so they don't know how to read it. And that document can be pretty daunting, especially as institutions require us to put more and more policies and resources and statements in our syllabi, all of which are very, very good and necessary, but uh, students will just skim over it and, you know, maybe get to looking at what do I have to do for tomorrow's class. So annotating the syllabus is a great way for students to um, share some of what they're worried about or curious about uh, in the course. And one of the most powerful things that I did kind of by mistake was that I asked students to identify one of the five uh, learning objectives or goals for the course that felt meaningful for them and to talk a little bit about why and what, what they hoped uh, they would achieve and accomplish. And then um, at the end of the semester, I had them go back to those annotations and revisit the uh, questions that they had. And, uh, you know, it was a little bit scary for me because I wasn't sure what would happen. You know, they might say, oh, I still have those questions or no, this goal was never met. But it was really exciting to see the self-reflection and the ownership that they took um, just through annotating the syllabus. I hope That's that really answers cool. Some of the questions. Oh, I love that. I, th I mean, I think it's one of the, I don't particularly pay attention to this, this channel on Twitter, but there's always the like seasonal complaints of like, oh, the, the student came to my office hours and asked me this thing and it was on the syllabus. It's like, so, you know, read the syllabus, but not just, you know, know that the syllabus there and read it, but really dive into it. Think about the expectations of the course. Um, and then that's part of, you know, I just love the idea of ownership that you talked about. I think that's such a big part of kind of becoming a college student is starting to own, you know, mm -hmm. um, the work and then as you obviously you know move to more advanced levels to really become a, a scholar yourself um so i love that yeah um, and I, I can tell you that one you know i know i'm, I'm not uh, you know a neurologist or neuropsychologist and i'm really interested to find out what is going on with our brains with all this online screen time and while i'm a huge advocate of access to texts and i think it's fantastic that we have uh, electronic texts. It, it can be, I think, also really difficult for students um, for all sorts of reasons, for me too, to just be staring at a screen for so long and to not be able to like manipulate it. And so uh, mm -hmm. the same is true with syllabi, especially moving to online, you know, being able to highlight and to note and to ask a question, to get a reply, to, you know, add a funny meme, to express your confusion. You know, these are all ways to kind of make these texts come alive um, in a very unique fashion and I think might be the key to helping uh, students in an online setting especially 
Um, but even in a face-to-face -face course where they're using electronic texts, um, allow them to, to, to live and breathe, you know, together, reader and, and writer or, or, you know, text and audience. Great. So the students are moving to, to, to uh, New Orleans. They arrive on campus uh, for, for school at Tulane. How does social annotation help orient them to what, what's going to be expected of them in the next uh, four years or continue with the however you want from that, Jacqueline? Yeah, I think that it really helps them be able to understand what's expected of them when when a professor um, assigns reading and what it means to be prepared for um, coming to class for discussion or even for lecture. Um, I, I use mostly discussion in my classes, and so it really helps um, get away from this mindset that you're going to be quizzed over information, you know, that it, there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Um, and so it really helps them build an interpretation and nuance um, in while they're doing their readings. Um, but also it helps them incorporate other readings um, together. So I have this exercise where every two or three readings, we go back and we look at the readings that we've annotated and we bring out common themes. Um, and then we will incorporate those into annotations. So we're always revisiting our annotations and our assignments and adding to them as the semester goes, um, goes on. Um, and that seems to help us draw connections across um, multiple readings. So it's not just every day is a different and by itself um, that we're drawing larger connections. I don't know if uh, you have that assignment in a way that you'd be willing to share, but that idea of, of revisiting annotations, if, so the, uh, if you have some, some kind of prompt that you use for that, it's a, it's a great idea. Um, something I'd love to share with the community. Sure, um, I, I don't have it with me right now, but I'm happy to share sure. it to you. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Um, and also give us feedback about the ways that we could develop the tool to better facilitate that kind of revisiting and harvesting of, you know, the gems or the ideas. Um, definitely my ultimate vision is that this is a way that, you know, your notes, your conversations move in a direction of a theme or a topic that then can be leveraged in, into maybe a final essay or some other summative project for a course. Mm -hmm. And the more that hypothesis can do to sort of tee the student up to have done that work and say, well, I've got this work, I've got this body of work that I can now use. Again, that's sort of one of those, those basic skills of college too, when you get the paper assignment, you're like, oh, wow, I should have been doing the reading. I should have been taking notes. I should have been having some topic around my notes because now I'm being asked to, to go back and do all this stuff. But with hypothesis, you've done that work. Right, um, it's there. And it really and does it's, show you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there. And so you can revisit it. It's not just you know a graded assignment. It's something that um, is right. a tool. Yeah. An indisposable one. I mean that in the sense that like you're not kind of doing something like a quiz. I love your your theme about the sort of disposable things like discussion forums, cookie cutter and quizzes kind of disposable. Those aren't really not going to use that. Um, but this is something that's indisposable, sort of sustainable, because you're going to hopefully continue to use it, maybe even the tool itself in, in another course at Tulane. Heather, your thoughts on how social yeah. annotation helps orient students to the college experience? Well, um, I do a really similar uh, thing. It's the idea that when we annotate, we can read a text and get something out of it. And then having the students return to it is one of the things that I've played around with doing both in class and then outside of class. Um, in my course, students have reflections that they put together about once a month for the course of the four month semester. And they're asked to think about the case studies that they've read about. And you can actually see them going back to the readings because hypothesis will show in Canvas that they've opened it again. And it doesn't show me what they've done and that's fine, but it does show that they're going back, they're looking up what they said or what others said and um, hopefully drawing on those texts, pulling out details to then incorporate into their own uh, comparison and contrast reflections or other reflections on the texts, but also on the concepts. But I actually do a reading quiz. I'm a, I, I do have some like um, concrete questions that I like them to get out, like teaching them to read, to find a detail, like um, what's the evidence that ancient Egyptians built the pyramids during the old kingdom? What are the tools and the artifacts that are found? And so by having them search for those answers and then find them, highlight them, I, we practice like, when you find an answer to a quiz question, highlight it, point it out, and they can take the quiz, you know, a couple of times, I think. 
Um, and then they have all of this knowledge built up in the annotations and the answers to the quiz so that when they're ready to write their reflection, as you said, it's all there. Um, so we're building something together as we go through these case studies together. That's great. Um, so I, I want to, there's been a rich conversation in the chat that I haven't been able to focus on because we've been, because uh, I've been engaged with you guys. Um, but I wanted to make sure I gave every, each of you a chance to sort of talk about some aspect of hypothesis, social annotation, the first year experience course that you teach um, that maybe I haven't been able to elicit in the, in the questions and conversation. Um, and maybe this time I'm just gonna sort of switch it up and start with you, Jacqueline, and see like, is there anything you were thinking about in preparation for this? Um, that you were thinking, uh, this is one aspect of my experience that I'd like to share with this community? Sure. Um, so I'm an editor of a guide called the Feminist Pedagogy for Teaching Online Guide, and I'll put that in the chat. Um, but this guide is really the basis of my pedagogy, whether it's in, in an online classroom or not. And this is an intersectional feminist framework. And it really, the, what some of the key tenets is this idea that knowledge is constructed. And so I feel like the social annotation tool really helps to, to show that 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 tenant is um, a big part of learning. Um, it also encourages cooperative learning. And so with students engaging together, um, but also treating students as agentic co-educators, their voice is as important as mine in the classroom. And I hope that by providing multiple ways for them to share their voices, whether it's through that social annotation tool or that gives them the confidence to talk in class, um, that we are you know, sustaining that model. Um, and it also creates self-care and boundaries. So what, maybe the student doesn't wanna talk in class, but they feel more comfortable on the social annotation tool. And, and, and something I struggle with too is sometimes students aren't comfortable with the social annotation tool. And so you know, it, it's not a perfect philosophy, but it is something that um, you know, I'm constantly striving and thinking about is how, how, do, how do you leverage technology tools in a way that supports pedagogy and what I believe in. I feel like there's an article here for uh, social annotation and this uh, feminist pedagogy that could come from you at some point. Let us know if we can we can help in any way. We'd certainly love mm -hmm. to uh, have you blog about it. Uh, one of the interesting things about what you said, Jacqueline, is you know those some of those concepts where right, you can introduce them to students um, and philosophically they may they may resonate, right? But like, what does it look like in practice, right? It's hard to like build and then outside of social annotation, like how do you make your classroom open to that, you know, more horizontal and um, and really show that knowledge is constructed, not just read some theorist around. And it, it, it's interesting to think that social annotation as a tool can help sort of see it in action, as it mm -hmm. were. Well, it's okay, um, to, it's okay to read old things, right? It's okay to read things that are outdated. And I think the social annotation tool helps with that. Yeah, and I, I just also love the idea that like you're part of this, you know, like you're writing on the text, you're not just reading, you're not just being told what other people thought in history, but you're contributing to that conversation. Um, Heather, let's go to you next. Anything that you were sort of thinking as you prepared for today that you wanted to share before we uh, open it up to conversation uh, questions? Um, one of the things that I really like about hypothesis is, we've touched on this a little, is the idea that when we're dealing with one of these challenging texts, um, that it gives students a way to participate in a way that feels comfortable. Uh, an example in my class is we talk about an article called Why the Whiteness of Archaeology is a Problem, because my discipline is historically very colonial and very uh, Western in its scientific perspectives and way of thinking. And even ideas like aliens built the Egyptian pyramids have an undertone of, of racism as they um, imply that indigenous peoples around the world were unable to create these great accomplishments on their own. And that's a kind of a big idea for students to tackle. And we are dealing with it throughout the entire semester. But when they read the article on whiteness and its role in archeology, span it gives students a way to have a much better conversation than we could have just by talking in the classroom because they, they want to choose their words very carefully um, in dealing with a topic as, as challenging as discussing race and racism. So I really, really value the way that they prepare uh, for difficult discussions by annotating in advance. And do any of you see that, I think a few of you have mentioned this, um, do any of you seen that play out? So like I might, 
customize myself to sharing my ideas with others via the asynchronous, you know, annotation and the time I have there. But then do you see that start to transfer into other areas where students gain confidence and are able to, um, to, to be more confident sharing, you know, in other contexts, their, their own ideas. I see lots of heads nodding. <laughs> I'll, I'll just share that the students sometimes just will say like, as I said in my annotation and then blah, and that's fine because then yeah. they're saying that this idea was so important that they wanted to share it both in text and then we're comfortable sharing it verbally with the large group or sometimes in their small groups, you'll hear that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that's, that's great because then I feel that they're prepared to have that difficult conversation. That's awesome. All right, Cheryl, we're going to just hear from you about anything you want to share before we open it up for questions. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of stay on that train. Um, you know, we have a lot of international students. We, we have a lot of first generation college students. We have a lot of non-traditional age students. We have a lot of students who have disrupted their education and come back. Um, we, and, and social annotation has empowered these students in a variety of ways uh, that allows their voice to be heard um, inside of the classroom, maybe through this kind of sideways path. And not only have students commented that uh, by annotating and rehearsing and, and then seeing their peers re replying and responding to their ideas, not only does it bolster their confidence to um, you know, speak in, in this class, but it has had a ripple effect in their other classes as well. Um, and they frequently say, you know, we wish we were able to use hypothesis mm -hmm. in our other courses. Um, and, you know, my pedagogy aligns really strongly with, with uh, both Heather and Jacqueline's in that uh, this decentering um, of the text of the instructor, um, you know, is, is a powerful tool. And uh, one of the things that I think is really kind of interesting, and again, I would love to study it, but I don't, I don't have the background to do that, is I think that something really powerful happens when a student doesn't necessarily hear their voice in class, but, but sees their ideas in print alongside the text of these published authors, if, if that's what you're annotating. Um, and it creates a kind of leveling or decentering that allows students to be, um, and I think I can't remember, Heather, if it was you or Jacqueline who said this, but sort of on the same journey, just maybe a little bit, you know, just got started, but but on the same journey as Marx or on the same journey <laughs> as MK Jemison or, you know, on the same journey. And, um, you know, that it liberates us from this kind of toxic belief that in order, and maybe I just reproduced that by saying, you know, in, in order to have anything to say, you have to already know, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then that really does diminish what's possible in terms of, of um, creative problem solving, contributing to the you know, world of ideas, uh, working on a very specific project, that kind of thing. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, in, in, in the, courses, the courses that I teach, a lot of collaboration happens, especially from the midpoint toward the end of the semester. And, and so uh, practicing these kinds of collaborations in a way that is a little bit less threatening, uh, where students have the time to think on their own, to select, you know, what in the text compels them, uh, or to ask for, for help or pose a question to another um, individual in class or to me, uh, does give them that low stakes uh, rehearsing of, of skills that are so important, you know, as they move out of the college environment and work with folks, you know, in a collaborative nature. So it's, um, you know, powerful in that way as well. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um... Well, I want, uh, we've got about seven minutes left, and there's been a, a lot of conversation in the chat, um, and I just want to give folks in the audience a chance to, I think you can raise your hand or something like that. Yes, there's a raise a hand button, or maybe some of my colleagues um, at Hypothesis saw a particular rich question that they'd like to, to surface, um, but at this point, I'd like to open it up to, to the audience to see what else they're interested in hearing about from our panelists. Uh, so, Jeremy, there are some questions. Um, I've been um, multitasking here, so haven't been able to completely focus on um, what's been said in the show. Um, I hate when that happens, but it does happen sometimes. So um, if these have already been answered, we can maybe answer them more fulsomely or move on to the next ones. Um, 
Hart Wilson has asked, um, are any of you using hypothesis in small groups? And if so, how does that differ from whole class discussions? I'm, I'm, yes, I, so sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually put students in teams ahead of time and have them working on uh, different type of types of annotations. So mm -hmm. one might be working on making connections to things going on in the world today. One team might be researching uh, interesting, you know, key terms or ideas and uh, providing uh, visual or, or verbal uh, embellishment or enrichment uh, for those. Uh, one team might be working on connections, connecting to other texts that we've read, um, other students' annotations in those texts. Uh, and then um, they'll do that prior to meeting in class if it's a face-to-face -face you know, synchronous session. Um, and then uh, they'll, I'll scramble those groups in class so that there's a sort of uh, expert from each group who has a sense of what their team was working on. And then they, they try to connect those ideas all together and um, you know, build a claim about the text. That's, that's one way. That's another assignment, Cheryl, that if you're willing to share, I bet, our, I bet folks would be very interested in. When you do that, I imagine you're not actually using like the, the group functionality in Canvas and Hypothesis because no. you want students to see each other's annotations in that context. Yeah. Do you have them use tags for that so it's easier I sure to pick do. out? Yes. Okay. Absolutely, cool. yeah. So they very have cool. um, you know, a tag for a group A, group B, group C, or, or if, a, if the group has like a, a basic question, then I'll have them mm -hmm. post that question as the tag. Um, I've yep. been experimenting a lot with tags lately, actually. Cool. Well, let's talk about that. There's, uh, I want, we want to build out functionality there to kind of go back and visit those different, you know, tags and themes. Um, others, small group work or uh, whether it's private groups, small groups or, um, or using tags for groups like, uh, like Cheryl. These are small courses I imagine already, so. <laughs> I have tried um, having them annotate within their small discussion group so that they can see who they're, they already know who they would be talking to. They've met these people in class. And I often will then put the groups on the big screen uh, in the classroom and kind of point out the best ideas or like the most, most thought provoking or the ones that generated a lot of discussion from the small groups. But I found that they like to know that I'm going to do that in advance so that what they did share in the small group then doesn't become public to the large group. So it's sort of a balance. Um, I really like the idea of giving the groups um, different tasks. Uh, I do similar things where you can ask, um, there's a question in the chat, how much and what kind of guidance do you provide students as to the types of comments and questions they can make? And I give suggestions like, point out key terms or make mm. a connection to the news, but I've never given that as explicitly. So that might be one way to do it without having to deal with the teeny tiny groups and all of the extra work that can sometimes lead to. Okay. Um, may, I, may I just jump in? Cause I wanna say that um, Cheryl has a hard stop at um, 9.45 or 12.45 where she is. So, um, let me just, it's two minutes of, so I just want to say, Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and so, um, sorry, you have to drop off and safe travels. Thank you. And I am absolutely happy. I'll put my email in the chat. Anyone can ping me anytime for sample, uh, you know, prompts and follow up. But there, I know there's a really rich and interesting conversation going in the chat around access, accessibility and screen readers. And I'm um, I have a lot to, to say and think about that too. So I, I'm happy to continue that conversation with folks who are working in the chat there as well on that topic. And thank you, Heather and Jacqueline. Bye, Jeremy. Bye, everybody. Bye, Cheryl. Thanks. Um, Jacqueline, did you want to add anything about this, the group question? Um, we, we just do um, some primary source analysis where I'll put up three different primary sources and then I assign different groups to do right. different, but I, it's not as robust with tagging, which I would love to learn more about. So this is a great conversation. Yeah, I would love, uh, we have this in kind of dispersed form. I'd love to bring together into a kind of teacher resource archive, the different ways that um, instructors prompt students 
um, in different contexts with annotations. Obviously, perhaps maybe at a graduate school level, you know, you don't necessarily need to tell students like how to annotate and give them an academic article and they're going to know maybe what to do. That's that's why they're in grad school. But there's a lot of steps along the way to get into that position. You know, what you might expect from a first year experience uh, course or first year seminar, new students at the college level, like what are you looking for? What activities are you performing as you read and really calling those out, whether it's in a, you know, a loose prompt that says these are five things you could do, you know, as you annotate just to help them think about what they're doing. Or you say, I want to do I want you to see do one of these or one each of these three things, you know, make a connection to the news, make a connection to another text, define a term um, somehow, whatever it is. I think that stuff is uh, it can be a key part of, you know. Structuring annotation for a first year seminar, so you're sort of teaching students to read or guiding them to read at the college level. Um, for any, any, maybe we'll just take five more minutes here to close out. Uh, any other questions that we want to? Yeah, we do. We have a, yeah, we have a handful more. Um, Roberto Kilkenny, I just want to say, I love your name, Kilkenny, what a great last name. Um, has anyone had experience with a visually impaired student using Hypothesis? And I know the document needs to be accessible, what, but what is the annotation part like? Thanks. Thank you, Roberta. I have not had that experience yet. Um, and so uh, I, I would just, I think it would work with hypothesis when that time comes and with our rep. Same yeah, here. There's been a lot of conversation and links shared in the chat and uh, we have an internal accessibility advocate um, and and partners too at other schools that have um, vetted the tool for accessibility help design um, accommodation plans and things like that um, so that I'm sure we could have put you in touch with other instructors and in schools that have worked with uh, students using various screen readers for example to um, to access hypothesis to create annotations and things like that um there, jeremy i was going to jump in this is becky, go, that's okay. go for becky. Uh, there was a question for panelists from brett frosco in the chat um about how much and what kind of guidance we provide students as to the types of comments questions that they can make on their readings i think i'd be okay hearing too about like what sort of guidance you're giving students just as they're getting comfortable with an, a new tool and having those conversations uh, and building that community with annotation adding my component to that as well. <laughs> I'm going to add my component to the question too. So what kind of guidance do you provide for the tool for their types of annotations? And one question I have is, does that change over the course of a semester? Because I, I, I've seen in some courses, you know, there'll be sort of one way that we're going to annotate throughout. These are the types of things we're looking for. And other times, like for this assignment, it's going to be different. And early on, it might be different from a sort of more summative annotation assignment. But it's great, great suite of questions there. So however you guys want to approach it, uh, maybe starting with Heather. Sure. Um, I have sort of like three or four kind of discussion questions or guiding questions that go along with each reading. And I post those in the sort of just um, the first page note uh, at the top of the page. But then I'll also kind of go through in some readings and ask them, you know, do you have experience with this or have you heard about this before right on the text? So I'll actually put annotations in myself before it's open to the students so that they have something to re to respond to and they don't have to answer those. Um, they can do something completely different. They can ask their own question or point out a definition or something interesting or surprising. But I found it helps if I ask a few questions, then they start asking those same kinds of questions later on and I don't need to do it as much as the semester goes on. Um, for for my courses, um, we oh goodness, I just lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. Um, so how what what do I how do I prepare them? Um, I um, provide a little prompt at the for every single discussion that is the same, and it's very uh, it's more like a free writing exercise. I tell them that they need to um, write eight to twelve robust sentences. Um, throughout the entire article. Um, and then I give them suggestions about what that might look like. Um, and I do say throughout because a lot of times students will use this to only read half the article. And so a lot, there are a lot of annotations in the front of the article and not so much towards the end. And so you can kind of get a glimpse of what students are reading. Um, but also some of the things I ask them to do is find the research question, 
find the author's argument, find the methods, look at the look at the citations, um, and ask questions. So those are kind of the things that I guide them through the reading. Cool. Um, and there's one more question that Franny's uh, surfaced for me that we'll we'll put out there and then uh, wrap things up. Um, uh, Franny can tell me who this is from, but it's I often hear people have had students pre-read annotate text before discussing them in class. Has anyone had students go back and revise, update their most useful annotations after the fact, potentially as expansion into papers or other writing? This was hinted at, um, but maybe we can end by talking about, okay, you've annotated. Um, what next? What do you do with those annotations? Uh, do you guys, ha I, I know one of you mentioned, I think, uh, go having students go back um, and reflect on their annotations. It might, might have been you, Heather, but maybe we can just sort of end by talking a little bit more about what do we do with all these annotations? <laughs> uh, and do you have any structured ways that you're having students do that? Um, let's start with you, Jacqueline. Um, I use an entry and exit ticket system. So the entry ticket is the annotations that they do and the exit ticket is a reflection where they go back in and they can add to their annotation or they can um, add new annotations, they can reply. And so it just kind of brings that discussion to an end. And then I can use those annotations as a way to figure out if I need to address other themes for the next reading or the next discussion. So for me, there it's a teaching tool as well as for them a reading tool. Can I just ask you to elaborate a little bit on that, Jacqueline? So I, if I'm still in your class, I got to compose an annotation to come to class, then we have a yeah. discussion. That's and the then, entry ticket. Uh -huh. And then how does and the exit ticket work? The exit ticket works, and this is something I learned um, from note cards, right? They used to have note cards where you do your entry ticket and your exit ticket. Um, but for the exit ticket, I'll maybe give them a prompt with a discussion question where they go back in and they add that to the annotation, or they can go in and revise their annotation, or they can reply to somebody. So it's just kind of to get a little deeper into closing that loop um, from and the, that pre-reading to the post-reading. Yeah. yeah, and are they doing that in class, actually with hypothesis, or is it something they do sort of as a second homework assignment? They do it as like back? a one minute paper, you know, kind of at the end in the last five minutes. And we don't always get to it, but we do it probably half half of the court half of the classes and are they actually going in with hypothesis mm -hmm. very yeah. interesting okay that is super cool um heather yeah the um the reflection that i mentioned is much more of like a like a one page written you know a couple of paragraphs which is again part of our first year seminar is developing just those um first person writing skills, which they've been maybe taught in high school that you're never to use I in your writing ever, ever. And then I ask them to give an individual reflection and they, they kind of start to struggle with that. So I haven't had them go back and actually revise their annotations in the process of doing that reflection. But I wonder if it could even take the place of such a reflection paper. I'm not sure if that would fit within our parameters of kind of how our first year seminar program works, but I think it's good to kind of push those boundaries and say, why does it have to be in a paper? Could we, could we make the reflection simply a return to the work that's already been done? So, um, yeah. Annotation as, uh, as formative and summative uh, assessment or project. Love it. Um, well, I know it's midday Friday for some folks, and we're rounding the corner towards the weekend here. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Franny to uh, close us out. But I really enjoyed this conversation. I think this is a really important conversation, and um, look forward to continuing to have uh, talk to you guys and collaborate around social annotation and first year experience and beyond. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, thanks to our wonderful guests today. Um, really appreciated your taking the time to be on the good margins with us, Heather and Jacqueline. Um, and um, shout out to um, Chris Aldrich for that last question. Chris, big fan of the show. Um, almost always with us on Liquid Margins. So we really appreciate you. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to say um, have a, a wonderful rest of your June. We'll probably see you again in July with the next Liquid Margins. And once again, um, keep annotating. <laughs>